I have not forgotten about this channel, do not worry. Hello everyone, loyal watchers of this channel. How are you? How am I? I've been great. The hair is getting a little long because obviously I can't go get a haircut. But hey, I thought I'd make a video today and just really look at what's been going on with the Habs during quarantine because they've actually been pretty busy. There's four little pieces of news I want to get to today. Uh, the signing of Cameron Hillis out of the Gulf Storm, the signing of Alexander Romanov out of the KHL, the 2014 playoff format that the NHL and the NHLPA are trying to figure out, and of course the retirement of Andre Markov, former Montreal Canadian. Start off talking about Cam Hillis. Third round draft pick by the Habs in 2018, as I said earlier, playing out of the Gulf Storm. This year was a big year for Gulf in a way that they weren't going to be heavy contenders for the Memorial Cup, I'd say. Especially with Nick Suzuki, you know him, leaving the OHL last year to come join the Habs. Isn't that funny? So you could really see that they needed someone to step up and take that offensive role. And Cam Hillis did just that. Got Hockey DB up in front of me. Last year, the 18-19 season, I mean... Uh, Cam Hillis in 33 games in the Gulf Storm, not a lot there, but 22 points then of course this year in the 1920 season, 62 games played, jumps up 83 points, 24 goals around there. Now, it's not the most uncommon thing for a guy who, you know, 19 years old, bit of an overager to go back to his developmental league and start lining it up, but the reason it's important with Cam Hillis is because he's always been known, or like the scouting reports that I've read on him is, that he's a very good two-way player, and as a centerman, that's kind of, I would say, is their first job. But the fact that he was able to go back and put up such a great season offensively shows that he's developing in an offensive role, which, I mean, do you want a centerman that can defend and attack? I sure would, and I think the Habs would as well. There's no such thing as too many centermen, so... Hey, and he's right-handed, which the Montreal Canadiens do not have a lot of right-handed you know, forwards in general. Off the top of my head, I think Jordan Wheel and I think Brendan Gallier, and that's about it. And how many of us, myself included, over the 1920 season, yelled about the fact that Jordan Wheel was on the power play? And you also look at right-handed players that the Habs have in this system outside of defense. The first one that comes to mind is Cole Caulfield, right? So, you know, all of a sudden in a few years, maybe you have Caulfield, you have Hillis. Now, I'm not saying this is a year or two down the line, but a little longer than that. You got Brendan Gallagher as a right-hander you can use on the power play. Caulfield, maybe even Cam Hillis. That looks pretty good to me. And this is also, uh, Cam Hillis is another 2000 player, which makes me feel really old since I'm a 99 kid and thinking, oh boy, man, these 2000 kids are getting that much closer to becoming full-time NHLers and it is terrifying. <laughs> One more thing on his offensive ability is there was a coach's poll done in the OHL and above the best playmakers in the OHL was, I believe, Cole Perfetti, a guy who's projected to go very high in the first round in this year's draft, if it ever happens, or when, I should say. And Cam Hillis was right up there. I believe he was top five in every single one of these categories. Been like, you know, two-way players, offensive, you know, a playmaking ability, as I mentioned earlier. Now, of course, again, to remind you, Cam Hillis is already 19 years old and was drafted in 2018. So, being a bit older and mature, he should have a better game. But to think that his offensive playmaking ability is kind of being said in the same breath as Cole Perfetti... He's not going to be that type of player. You know, I think Cam Hillis' is ceiling is middle six player. But still, seeing that gives Habs fans a lot of hope. And, I mean, it makes me smile. I mean, we all overvalue the prospects of the team we cheer for. But still, I think it's a lot of good stuff to hear about the prospect. There are also some names I've got written down here. Arvid Hendrickson, Samuel Oud, Cole Fonstad, and Alec McShane. These are all fellow Habs prospects that uh, the Canadians have drafted over the past few years. But what's significant about those names is they are probably not going to get deals from the Habs. These are a group of players that have been talked about by, you know, guys like Marc-Antoine Godin, Arpan Basu, all like the big Eric Angles, the real noted Habs journalists out there in the world of sport media, and... They are mentioned in the breath of, of all of these group of players, only one of them was really going to get a deal, and Cam Hillis is the one who's beaten out his competition. So, I mean, before he's even a hab, he's already kind of beat out his competition for something, which I think for him has got to be a huge morale booster. He'll definitely be, I mean, he won't be a hab next year. Definitely not, I wouldn't say, uh, depending on when that season even starts. But Cam Hillis will definitely be a dominant force or a good piece, at least in the Laval Rocket system for the next few years, I'd say. And I honestly think he's a safe bet to be a future NHLer. Next, we'll talk about Andre Markov, the general, as they called him. And I don't know what, how to start really with Andre Markov, other than there was never a more reliable player, I'd say, on the Habs, or skater-wise, because 
We'll, we'll exclude Carey Price. He's been goalies with you, right? You know, you can't really count them. But I have always been very critical about the Habs' left side. And I slowly realized throughout this year that it has, um, the Montreal's left side, the defense, I mean, has never quite been the same since Andre Markov left. And I won't even go into the whole, you know, the Bergevin negotiations and loyalty in the dog, that whole saga along with Alex Radulov. I don't want to focus on that here. But what I do want to talk about is Andre Markov's numbers and what he's really meant to the Habs or what he did mean to the Habs. Some numbers just for you to hear. He has, Andre Markov, the second most points amongst Habs defensemen in history, second most assists, second most power play goals, second most game winning goals, the third most goals period by a defenseman for the Montreal Canadiens. The only guy ahead of him on those lists are going to be Larry Robinson. Uh, that's a pretty big name. In 990 NHL games played, 10 short of a thousand. I know it hurts. It hurts. Thank you, Bergerman. Andre Markov had 119 goals. 453 assists, again, as a defenseman, for 572 points. He was also an all-star, if you guys remember. When the news of Markov first came out, the first thing I saw people gifting and, you know, talking about on Twitter was P.K. Subban's goal versus the Sens in 2015 playoffs. Uh, first round, where Subban had that wicked cannon goal against, I believe it was, yeah, it was the Hamburglar back then, Andrew Hammond during his magical run. And it was just the visual of the camera zoomed in on PK, and Andre Markov just give them the kiss. And the reason I bring up a PK goal in relation to Andre Markov's retirement is because there was nothing quite like the quiet partnership of PK Subban and Andre Markov. When they were both Canadians, they were staple to each other. And I don't think PK Subban gets anywhere near a Norris Trophy without being able to play with Andre Markov because it was Subban able to take the risks and it was Andre Markov covering for him. And again, a lot of us think of Montreal's power play and they think of the big shot from Weber, or before that it was P.K. Subban's massive cannon. But it was really Andre Markov who was the guy that was quarterbacking that power play. And what do you know, just like the left side of the defense, since Andre Markov has been gone, the power play has not been the same in Montreal. I guess just a final note is thank you to Andre Markov. Just one of the quietest halves that just went along, did his business. It was just such a good top four defenseman, for, or top pairing at this time in Montreal. Just a defenseman that no one talked about, but really was just such a stalwart of a player. Just such a staple of the Montreal Canadiens. I think before he left, he was easily the longest serving half. But we will go from one Russian left-handed defense into another, and we will talk about the signing of Alexander Romanov. And this is a young defenseman out of CSKA Moscow, and he is a name that you will have heard about any time there's a World Junior Tournament, a prospects ranking, the best defenseman outside the NHL, you will hear the name Alexander Romanov. Before going into the specifics of what Alex Radulov and Romanov, I, that's like take three and I'm still making that mistake. Alex Romanov, before going into him as a specific player and what he will bring to the Habs, I want to bring up just Habs fans, I need you all to be happy having Alexander Romanov because there was, and every fan base has those people, that Romanov and the news of him coming to Montreal came about a few days after the Leafs had signed Miko Lettinen. And of course, this year has just been, going back to the World Juniors, the two top defensemen, I think it was the like team of the tournament, the two defensemen were Leafs prospect Rasmus Sandin and Montreal Canadiens prospect Alexander Romanov. So Habs and Leafs fans have been going back and forth, back and forth between which one of these defensemen are better. And then, you know, the Leafs get this Miko Lettinen guy and all of the Habs journalists have been writing about, oh, they should try and get this guy. And then he goes to Toronto, but then the Habs bring in their guy. And then it's just everyone, no one's happy. You no, know? because then you have Leafs fans saying, oh, Sandine's better. And, oh, that's your consolation prize for not getting Miko Lettinen. And then you have Habs fans going back saying, da, 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 don't worry about it, all right? Alex Romanov is not going to be, and Bergeron has said this in the press conference, not press conference, but in an interview himself, that Alex Romanov is not going to be Eric Carlson and score you 80 points and 20 goals. He is a, if I had to make a right off the top of my head NHL comparison, he's kind of like a Brett Pesci, a, a sort of um, Jacob Slavin or Jonas Brodeen, those type of defensemen that you don't hear their names in the headlines because they're not the offensive weapons that, you know, a, a, a Morgan Riley would be. But Alex Romanov, in a few years, he might even do it right away in a top six role, but 
in a few years, the key to Romanov as a player is that he is defensively sound and he breaks up plays. So what Alex Romanov brings to the table is that he will be making Carey Price's job a lot easier, which the reason I bring up Andre Markov before I brought up Romanov is because that was something that I think Markov did a great job of. And now, you know, it, it, you almost wish Markov was still around so there could be that, you know, oh, passing the torch type of thing. But I, I really think that's what we need to remember and keep in mind with Romanov. There were comparisons to Drew Doughty. Uh, stop it, please. But I just don't want Habs fans to now think, you know, we're, we're going to get this, like, Norris Trophy type of defenseman, right? Because this is not going to happen. Because, first of all, the NHL doesn't value a defensive defenseman. But this is the exact type of player that Montreal need. And, again, he's not going to come in and immediately be a, you know, contributing, fantastic top four defenseman. Again, he's only 20 years old. So, but a great, fantastic signing for the Habs and a guy we've all been wanting to see in the Blue Blanc Rouge for a long time now. We'll finish with the 2014 playoff format. Yeah, as I said earlier, uh, originally from, I believe, Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman that the NHL and the NHLPA right now are figuring out the details between a, sorry, for a 2014 playoff format because with everything going wrong this year, you know, the whole pandemic and all of that, that now instead of just going off points percentage and doing the normal 16-team playoff, the NHL, and I mean, you can see why they would do this, are now going to be going for, let's try and recoup some money here. And if you go to a 2014 playoffs, instead of just doing 16 off a of points percentage, you all of a sudden now at 23rd and 24th place, bring in the Habs, and you bring in the Chicago Blackhawks, aka two of the biggest markets in the league. And then everyone starts talking about the whole idea of, oh, is this going to be a legitimate cup? Is it not? And I'm of a very strong opinion that it depends on who wins it. <laughs> if I told you that the St. Louis Blues, before this pandemic, were probably favorites to win the cup, you'd agree with me. If I said the Boston Bruins, who lost to the Blues in the cup final last year, were to win, you wouldn't question it. If I said the Tampa Bay Lightning, you'd say, sure, why not? What if I said the Jets? You'd start questioning, like, that was a wild card team, but, you know, Connor Hellebuck and their offensive weapons. If I said the Leafs, you could say the same thing about the Jets, really, you know, the offensive weapons. And, I mean, Frederick Anderson, despite having a rough year, could always turn it on. I mean, but then you just start going to those teams where there's still question marks. And then you go to these 23rd, 24th place teams. Montreal, Chicago. Both teams who have no right to be anywhere near the playoffs. And the only reason that they are there is because the league are trying to recoup some of the billions of dollars that they're currently losing. And Montreal and Chicago are two of the biggest, richest teams in the league. So guess what? At the end of it, we hate the business side of, of the game, really. But it's a factor that we cannot ignore and that the league cannot ignore. And I mean, just my personal opinion here. I wouldn't even bother with the playoffs because, first of all, you're figuring out a playoff format, which really, if you sat down with your, you know, the board of governors, the PA, for a few days, if you just sat down and focused on it, you could have a playoff format figured out like that, okay? It's not hard. You know, it's like, what are you doing all day? Steve Dangle loves to yell about, uh, you know, player negotiations and all that, right? I don't understand why you're focusing so much on this format when you don't even have anything figured out of like how you're going to do testing the Canadian border 14 day playoff um so not playoff but you know 14 day quarantine for COVID and all that there's just I would figure out you know how to deal with the current pandemic before you try and figure out how you're going to award the Stanley Cup it's just ridiculous and to finish off let's just talk about the elephant in the room that everyone has just been since Elliot Friedman arguably if not the most reliable the second most reliable reporter in hockey it's either him or Bob McKenzie, said that teams were worried about a rested carry price. And then the fans of every other NHL team just went like that and said, oh, he's overrated. No, he's not, by the way. No one is saying he's the best goalie in the world anymore, all right? But he's still a good damn goalie nonetheless. And it doesn't matter what you quite think about him. Elliot Friedman, who was very careful with his words, is saying that other teams are worried about Carey Price. Regardless of what you think of him, he is in the heads of other teams. Like, that is ridiculous. 
And I, I mean, if you just look at Carey Price in big game scenarios, look at his save percentage in the playoffs. I mean, his international record, man, he can win big games. So, I mean, I would be worried too. But, I mean, just everyone's just ignoring the fact that I'll say, I hate to repeat myself, Elliot Friedman is saying that other teams are worried about that man. That's hilarious to me. And that every other fan base is getting so upset about it. I mean, come on, guys. I mean, like, if the Habs even make it into this format, by the way, they have to play the Pittsburgh Penguins. Jake Gensel might be back. Oh, by the way, Crosby and Malkin. Oh, by the way, Matt Murray and Tristan Jari. Oh, by the way, Chris Tang. All right, quickly lost some footage for something, so just going to reshoot this now. Uh, when it comes to the 2014 playoff format, um, I would like Habs fans to imagine this. Because no matter what, and there is a motorcycle driving by my house. This happens all the time. God dang it. It's gone. Sorry. So when looking at this playoff format, okay, regardless of just how the chances of Montreal winning are pretty low, is I think of I would be happy if they won because, oh my God, it's a Stanley Cup. Could you imagine seeing Carey Price lift it? It would be, it would be amazing, you know? Just here, here he is. Imagine it's him. He's going, woo, fantastic. I would love to see Carey Price lift the Stanley Cup. It's my favorite, favorite player of all time is Carey Price. The problem is I would rather see him win it with, with you know, fans in the stands, right? You know, it's just, I feel like even if you're a team who wins it and you're a Blues or a Bruins fan, does it really mean as much to you under these current circumstances? I don't think it would. Um, I definitely would not to me. So just quick little insert there. Man, I think that's gonna be. I gotta take off the big one blazer because it's like 23 degrees here in uh, here in Pickering, Ontario. But I think to end off the video entirely here, I'm gonna say this. Um, yeah, sorry, I haven't been uploading since like February, I think. Um, it's just with the end of the season. Uh, even though the the quarantine started like two months after my last video, but still, um, it's weird that this channel had like nine subscribers before the pandemic started. I think it was up to 12 last time I checked. So somehow. We're getting a big boost in viewership since then, so thanks for watching. Uh, use those, uh, sorry, those of you out there who subscribe, uh, love to see ya. Um, also, if, I don't know, let's say you love hockey, and maybe you like listening to me talk about hockey. Uh, I've mentioned in videos before, but just, just dedicate the whole end of the video to it. Myself, my friend Alex from Ryerson University, and our other friend Daniel, who is doing a master's in journalism at Ryerson as well, uh, we all have a podcast together called the 2 one Podcast. It's currently uh, on every platform you can think of. iTunes, Spotify, all that kind of stuff. Lovely, lovely stuff. We still try and talk about everything hockey every week. Uh, and since the pandemic has started, we also have a second episode a week where we normally, you know, back when everything was normal, we would normally have two episodes per week. But since the pandemic has started, sorry to repeat myself, we started doing something called Bizarre Adventures, where, you know, we'd look at something like Star Wars or um, Back to the Future, Moneyball, that type of stuff. So if that tickles your fancy, I mean, go check out the show. And again, it's more hockey. On Sunday, we'll be looking at this summer's UFAs, maybe doing some redrafts. I don't know, all this lovely type of stuff. So I guess... I'll see you next video. Don't know when that will be. Don't know what it will be about. Um, and or I'll see you if you go listen to the podcast, which you totally should. So, uh, and again, to all you listeners out there, uh, I know there's not a lot of you, but uh, for those of you who do watch these videos, I hope you and your friends and your family all staying safe, and I will see you next time.